Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very senior and accomplished professional from Canada, Karen Lilly. Karen, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Karen is the Vice President, People and Culture of Air Acoustics Engineering Limited. So, Karen, before we start talking about human resources and culture, tell me about your own journey in brief. Oh, yeah. So I actually had a pretty unique journey to getting to human resources, mainly because I said I would never work in HR. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, ending up there on this path was quite was quite an interesting turn. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually trained as a high school teacher Mm -hmm. and uh, and a secondary high school teacher in England. And I uh, was doing that for a little bit and came back to Canada because this is where I, my family was based and was waiting for all my stuff to be transferred over. Mm-hmm. And uh, it took so long that I ended up temping at a bank on a yeah. contract while I was waiting for everything. Another thing I said I would never do was work in a bank. My mom was always like, be a banker. <laughs> I was like, no. Um, but it ended up being amazing. Uh, and what I found from that was that in the bank alone, there were several different kind of career paths. Mm. And the teaching degree that I had was actually very transferable into HR. Mm. Uh, so I started doing learning and development um, and career pathing within risk management. Mm. Um, and that's how I started, started to sort of work with some HR professionals. Mm. Um, they got to know me. And so they asked if I wanted to move into the HR function as, a, as an HR business partner. Uh, so I did that. And I became an HR business partner for risk, uh, marketing, I did. Um, I also had finance at one point. Uh, I, I was the HR business partner for technology. I did a lot of the corporate functions. Um, I like marketing so much. I did some marketing uh, at U of T for continuing mm-hmm. studies. So I went into the marketing group for a couple of years mm-hmm. uh, as an agency management person. Loved it, uh, but ultimately really missed working on the people stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so went back into human resources as uh, a talent advisor. Um, and that is somebody who is internally uh, guiding and coaching talent on where they can move in the career path mm. they can have, mm. uh, transfer skills within the bank. And so um, I like that so much that I started to uh, get my coaching certification uh, to become an official coach. And uh, and then I decided after you know a few more years of different movements uh, that I wanted to start my own consulting company uh, to help small and medium-sized businesses uh, in the HR sort of space for for companies specifically that couldn't afford to have a massive human resources Mm, mm. section and also career coach Mm. Uh, and the career coaching really focused on students um, because I felt that um, you, you have guidance counselors at school, but there's only one person, 450 to 500 students and they're really struggling with what they can do in university or college Mm. Mm. and how to actually apply that when they graduate. Mm. Um, So it was a big passion of mine still is, um, and, and so I really like helping them understand what else is out there instead of, you know, the big five that people are told about, you know, oh, you can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, you can be a teacher, you can go into, you know, police. And that was kind of always the thing or a teacher. Um, and there's so much more out there. So, mm-hmm. uh, I love that, but ultimately I missed working with a team, missed, uh, you know, missed having that sort of organizational feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so started working at, um, Air Acoustics Engineering Limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, with um, a team of acoustical engineers who are fantastic. Uh, I took over their human resources function or people and culture, as we call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where I am now. So fantastic. Uh, been a crazy, crazy ride. Fantastic. So you, you seem to have done it all. But my question to you is that how have you seen human resources change and evolve uh, oh, yeah. over the last few decades? So much so that the CHRO now is a very key member of uh, the C-suite. Yes. Um, so I think the big traditional view of HR, which is honestly why I said I never wanted to do it, was mm-hmm. that it was, oh, it's just the hiring and firing, you know, and you go in and HR is in the room and that's, you know, that's sort of, that's all they, you know, that's how they viewed. The brand was kind of, you know, mm-hmm. not a great mm-hmm. brand. Um, they weren't seen as partners. They weren't seen as, you know, being effective leaders. Mm. Um, and the, the dial has moved so far on that now that people and culture is an integral part to everybody's um, mm. organization uh, because people first. And uh, everybody has noticed or realized that there's a huge correlation between um, productivity, engagement, of, like engagement and motivation of employees mm. and your productivity. Mm. 
Right. And so the more engaged and more and motivated your employees are, our team members are, mm -hmm. um, the better the business does. Mm -hmm. And how to do that is engaging your, you know, your human resources people, um, especially, I'd say, within the sort of the DE&I space um, and the wellness space now mm -hmm. uh, with all the mental health crisis and different things that are happening, um, there really is a focus on on people and culture being, uh, you know, very, very important to all, all aspects of a business. Mm -hmm. um, and also now, uh, HR is using more data to drive decisions mm -hmm. um, and more technology, whereas mm -hmm. that wasn't, wasn't happening before. And right. I think, uh, you know, they're really pushing the strategic mindset of mm -hmm. people and culture um, more so than ever before. Mm -hmm. Well said. And, uh, you know, I've been talking to many HR leaders like yourself. Uh, most people say that one of the most challenging periods that HR leaders have gone through is during the pandemic, because it was necessary to keep your flock together. It was necessary to adjust to multiple forms of working from home, uh, you know, hybrid and so on and so forth. I want to understand from you, what are some of the key HR challenges a lot of organizations have faced uh, or will face post the pandemic. Yeah, um, I think this has also put the the light on the people and culture space as well as understanding, Correct. you know, how important they were in switching the gears during this um, the pandemic. Hmm. There's a couple things. I think workforces were already sort of um, looking at how to do uh, like compress their footprint and become more remote and hybrid, but their plans were over like multi years. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it just it forced everybody to be more agile and quicker and get, you know, get set up quicker than, than anything. Um, one of the biggest challenges was obviously keeping your, your team motivated, um, preventing burnout, mm -hmm. uh, burnout went you know skyrocketing based on the fact that you're always on um right. and being on screen and being is, is tiring um, mm. and there's no there's no way to sort of separate where your work is and from your home and mm. some people were in small condo like there was a lot of things that that really you know um that were really hard for a lot of people then so so burnout was big keeping your team together mm. um figuring out how you can keep your culture alive mm. uh when you can't meet up and then the big one as well was remote management mm. um you know, some of the some of the leaders found that really hard, um, especially the, uh, the so-called micromanager um, who needs to see their their team members at their desk every day and and think that they are they're working hard there. Um, mm -hmm. It was a big adjustment for them. Uh, so so leading remotely was very hard. Um, and now I think the struggle is, is that everybody has has learned how to work remotely. Um, and there's been a lot of great, uh, great things have come from that, like expanding mm -hmm. talent pools. Um, you can now hire people that don't live locally because they mm. can, you know, work remotely. Um, it's been a huge thing for for females uh, in the working place, uh, for flexibility with family. Uh, so these are some really great things. But what I think companies are now struggling is, um, do they now start bringing people back in more? Mm. Um, does that actually impact productivity? What happens, you know, if you keep the remote culture? So you've got two dichotomies. I think you've got the the team members who've gotten so used to working remote, love the flexibility, um, have really figured out a good a good working strategy. Mm. And then owners and business leaders um, who need to have their teams together more often mm. can do now. And so we're struggling with that. How often do you do that? And meeting both in an equal spot is, is a tough place to play. Correct. Well said. The other question that I wanted to get your perspective was on this two big buzzwords that seem to be doing their rounds, which is the great resignation and the great termination. Yeah. How how much of these two, the resignation and the termination, have been impacted because of the pandemic? Oh, so I think the great resignation was definitely driven by by the mm -hmm. pandemic. I think mm -hmm. um, being in the career coaching space at that time, um, that was also you know a big a big key indicator was how many people were reaching out and saying, mm -hmm. you know, I've really had this time to think about how much I. I don't love what I do, um, mm. or they've lost their their jobs. So they're starting to think about upskilling, um, and so really, what people did was they couldn't go to work, and so they started to take courses. They started to reflect on their lives. Um, they realized they had other skill sets they loved, uh, and so yeah, they were you know one. I think there was a big shift in motivators and mm. a big shift in people looking for other career paths. But then also we've got that same thing about well, I'm used to being remote. Mm -hmm. I like my flexibility. Mm -hmm. You want me to come back in four or five times a week. Mm -hmm. I'm not willing to to give up my my family work life balance. Yeah, uh, I think there's a big thing now about you know people shifting gears and thinking you know 
I want to spend more time doing things I love with the people I love Correct. Um, more so than, you know, being chained to my desk or, you know, um, you know, working, like living to work and, you know, working to live instead kind of thing mentality took over. Right. So I do think there was a big drive before that um, to mm. the, the great resignation. Fascinating. And uh, the next question that I had was on, uh, you know, what you were just speaking about, that people want to spend more time at home. Uh, mm. And therefore, a lot of people have started to work towards what I would refer to as the gig economy or mm. you know, doing multiple tasks. What are your perspectives on multitasking or uh, you know doing multiple jobs? I think it's fascinating. Um, and you definitely are seeing more of that. And, and um, I kind of love it, actually. I think that it's interesting that you can have all these different passions and start different different things and bring in different um, different revenue sources. Mm. Um, it's actually pretty smart in a way because mm. if one if one revenue source fails or um, you know the economy changes and things change so quickly, technology is always advancing. Things are coming into play. If you've got other things that you can rely on, mm. um, that's great. Especially as we look at you know, are we going into recession? How bad is the recession going to be? Having multiple things that you can rely on. Um, is never a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And it's always honing in on more skills, driving, you know, all the different um, different attributes you have. Uh, it will also keep you engaged. Um, so I think that's great. I mean, I do believe you have to have a certain personality for it um, to be sort of the, the entrepreneur gig, gig kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure me personally would thrive in that situation. Mm -hmm. I do love stability and team. Um, but I think for the people that can do it and, and want to do it, it's it's a fantastic option. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was speaking to a young individual and I ask, asked her the same question about uh, multitasking and doing multiple or multiple roles. And she gave me an absolutely incredible answer, which I had never thought about. She said, well, as the CEO of a company, you can run the company and also sit on several boards. Yeah. So why can I not do work for your company and do multiple jobs? I said, very it's, logical. It's it's fascinating. And I think, you know, the again, the issue comes to like as a business owner, we're paying you to do a job. Hmm. Um, and I think it, it, it spreads fear in people thinking that they're not spending all their time and energy on the job that they are paying you to do. Hmm. Uh, so the question comes, you know, when are you spending the extra hours? Where are those hours coming from? Um, and it makes people nervous. Hmm. That's it. Uh, one more question uh, related to HR, then we'll move to culture. Uh, you, we, you mentioned very briefly about how technology is changing human resources. And I've been speaking to several people and they talk about artificial intelligence, which is mm -hmm. uh, being used extensively in human resources now. Uh, I'd love to get your perspective on how is technology changing HR? I think um, the fact that we are able to actually get systems that that hold all of our people data now and can actually drive insights um, is making HR more analytical and more um, strategic. So I think before it was hard to get accurate information from from any kind of source. It was all mm -hmm. over the place. And I think with the advancements of all of these these um, you know culture indexes, and you you know there's multiple companies out there that will sell you platforms now for performance management and engagement indexes and surveys and and all these things that uh, it's almost you know it's hard to to sort of sort them all out and figure out what the best way to go is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's up the ability to actually hear and speak. I think to your your team members at large. Mm -hmm. um, and gather that data and then use that from the technology sources to actually drive and implement a good people strategy. Mm -hmm. um, before it was more, I think, just gut and feel, or maybe there wasn't even a whole emphasis on, on people strategy. Um, but being able to use all these technologies now um, to drive culture and performance is is huge. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So let's now move to culture. Karen, how do you define culture? Uh, and you're the boss of culture for your organization. Uh, I like to be called the boss. Um, <laughs> uh, the culture. So I think it is um, that that drive and want to be in the work and the company that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, so the culture is what drives your team members, mm -hmm. um, gets them excited. It's the it's the other factor, mm -hmm. uh, and it's what gets you to spend that discretionary effort. The effort that's not quantified, the effort that's kind of above and beyond. Um, having a good, strong culture where people really love their team, like working together, mm -hmm. um, gets you good results. Um, it makes people want to do the work that they're there to do. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, uh, when I joined uh, this large company, the two words that were talked about were values and culture, and they're still as relevant today, 45 years later. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you, are these words uh, simply lip service or are they really being actioned upon? No, they're, they're um, for us especially, they're very actionable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, sometimes it can get lost, I think, in some of the bigger corporations mm-hmm. um, because they, you know, there's uh, different, you know, levels and different areas, different things happening. And so it's a lot harder to get sort of a beat on, on that overall, I think. Um, so I do believe sometimes you can find in large organizations that it is a bit of a lip, lip service mm-hmm. and there's more work to be done there. Mm-hmm. Um, in small, medium-sized companies, I think it's it's an integral part of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and for us especially, uh, we have our values written on the wall. Um, we have our values at the front of, at front of the office. Um, we have a recognition platform and everything we recognize is, is linked back to our personal values. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the culture piece, uh, well, I mean, just the fact that, you know, we have a culture uh, person looking after and making sure that, that that's very much alive mm. uh, shows how important it is to, to organizations like our own. Mm. And uh, what role does leadership play in, in developing and building a strong culture? Oh, there, if you don't, if you don't have a strong leadership team who um, align with your values in and want to drive the culture, then, then there's a there's a problem um, because they are the face of their groups. Mm. Uh, they are the they are the ones that are you know heading up the town halls or at the events or you know speaking to everybody. And if they are walking the talk, um, then there's there's a, an alignment issue and and that that causes more problems. Mm. Um, so leadership is absolutely a, a very important part. You have to all be aligned um, and walking in the same direction. Mm. And you know I was talking to some senior leaders on my podcast and I asked them about culture and they said, well, in our, in our organization, the CHRO is responsible for culture. I'd love to get your thoughts. <laughs> I think that uh, you can put in the steps to drive a good culture, but it's mm. the responsibility of everybody. Mm, I agree. Well said. <laughs> uh, my next question is on how does culture impact belonging and building meaningful relationships within an organization oh yeah it's it's I, again i think it's the foundation of it um if you haven't built a culture where you know i think we feel very strongly about our culture specifically because um we always say we're family first and you know we're flexible um and we enjoy doing things together mm. um and i think that that is all part of our team and you see our team working together and they have strong bonds and friendships. And it means so much because if somebody is overloaded or has a lot of work going on, it means that the camaraderie is there and another team member jumps in and says, how can I help you? What can I take on? And you see mm-hmm. that happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's a really important part of culture and team building and, and being there for each other. Um, and that's, you know, I see it every day. Um, mm-hmm. The team genuinely likes each other Mm. um, and and gets along and wants to be there and wants to help each other out. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Next question is on changing culture. You know, I've come across old established organizations where the new guard is coming in and then they start talking about, we've got to change the culture. I'd love to get your perspective on what goes into changing established culture. It is a tough one, um, especially in large uh, organizations that have had it ingrained. And I think it goes, um, you have to start by hiring people and um, having leaders who are really aligned to the change Mm. um, and want to push it. Um, You also have to have a a clear idea of where you want to go. So I think, you know, part of it is the culture change or the the pulse surveys that people do. Mm. Um, That those give you great insights into what, uh, team members are thinking um, and talking to team members and understanding what you know what's not working and, and what is working mm-hmm. and then putting that into your plan. So having a good plan, strong plan, where you want your culture to go, what you want your values to be and how you want to align to those mm-hmm. and then getting strong leaders and people to align to those and drive that. Um, mm-hmm. If people aren't aligned and don't want to drive it and aren't walking the talk and don't have the capabilities uh, and the competencies that you're looking for, uh, then it won't succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so often that does mean that you have a bit of a change in guard uh, and people have to have to shift and move uh, in order to allow for that new culture to be born. 
Amazing. I have time for two more questions, uh, Karen. My next question to you is, how does a young company or a startup build a strong culture? Mm. So I think it's actually about um, spending time and getting to know each other. Mm. Uh, so who are the people that you're working with? Mm. Um, understanding, you know, what um, what form of praise they like, what's the differences. Uh, not everybody's going to be alike. So understanding that and then meeting everybody halfway. So I think, mm. you know, once you understand who your team members are, um, I believe you then start to create programs um, and and different things that help them thrive. So there's different things that you can do. So we have um, at our company, we have unlimited PTO. Um, and we have that in place because we think that, you know, again, um, like work-life balance and stress and like why stress about it? if you need personal days or you need something mm. to get done, why stress about the fact that you only have two? You know, so taking care of your people and listening to who they are, um, I think is the foundation. And then coming up with ways uh, that you can be together um, mm. and spend time together that's not working mm. is another way. Mm. Um, during this, we've done a lot of um, we've done a lot of what we call pub trivia's, but they're online in an online platform at a place called on a gather is the really? is what we use. Mm. Um, it has a pub setting in it, uh, mm. so we do pub trivia and we bring everybody in, and so you can do it remote. Everybody can join. Um, it's fun. It's just something that we do. Um, or we just have like a social uh, in the in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, we bring in food and different stuff like that. It's celebrating, um, celebrating milestones, celebrating people, making sure you're recognizing. That mm. is a huge part. Even in small, like the smaller teams, even it's even easier to do that. Recognition goes a long way. Um, people like to be recognized differently. So I think understanding how your team members like to be recognized, whether it's publicly or privately, but making sure that you are taking that time to say thank you um, and we appreciate what you're doing um that's the starting and the foundations of bringing your team together and building a strong mm, culture fascinating and my last question to you karen and this is for the many many people who will listen to our conversation based on your own amazing journey and all your own learnings in the area of human resources and culture what would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away from your journey and from our conversation um I would say be agile is one. Okay. Um, so think about how you can be flexible and understand how your skills are transferable. Mm -hmm. So always think about how you can use your skills and how you can transfer them to other mm -hmm. places. Yeah. Um, stay true to your own values. What motivates you and what, yeah. and what drives your values? Because you know what? You spend a lot of time at work. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't feel like you're happy or that you're meeting your values, um, that is a huge, that's a huge problem, um, because it's going to eat into the, the rest of your, your life. Mm -hmm. Um, and really spend time thinking about what it is. I'd say the third thing is, is really start thinking about and focus on what your strengths are, mm -hmm. um, and what you enjoy doing and seeing if that aligns with your career path and where mm -hmm. you are and what you're doing, and then use that to network, um, keep your network open. Always make sure that you're talking to new people hmm. um, and learning. Hmm. Fascinating. And on that note, uh, Karen, and your three amazing lessons, be agile and flexible, understand your skills uh, properly. The second one you said was stay true to your values. But then the third one you said is so critical, focus on your strength and then find the right networks to be in. Thank you so much for speaking to me about your journey. Thank you for speaking to me about human resources and all the work that you're doing in the area of human resources. Thank you also for speaking to me about culture. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.